national water model, which basically the rivers and the channels throughout the continental US. And the idea behind this work is to update or add to the capability that is currently existing through the Muskingum Kunj method. Um, and the method that we are suggesting switches automatically between the dynamic, diffusive, and the Muskingum Kunj method as needed. And I would like to acknowledge my uh, collaborators, Nazmul uh, Beck from Tulane University, James Dunha, Fred, and Trey are from the National Water Center in Tuscaloosa. What I will present today is a set of benchmark examples where we examined uh, those various routing schemes uh, to gauge their speed and their relative accuracy to one another. So uh, I will start with uh, the Lower Mississippi River example, which is the uh, basically the downstream most 400 kilometer of the Mississippi River. And we applied all three methods, Muskingum Kunj, Diffusive, and Dynamic Wave um, at that portion of the river. And um, as you can see, uh, we wanted to examine the relative speed of these methods. And you can see here that the dynamic wave uh, took uh, approximately about 1,600 seconds to run 11 years. The diffusive wave was an order of magnitude faster than that. And it was quite comparable, uh, maybe slightly faster than the Muskingum Kunj. So that was an interesting uh, benchmark experiment that we've done. And we do have and in internal flags or triggers within the code that identifies the appropriate method to apply. So um, if we look at the two terms, FC and FI, if they are typically much larger than one, which both are in this example here, and that alerts us that we can use either the kinematic and the diffusive wave. And if that's the case, then we go down uh, the, to look at the other parameter, D, which is another flag, if it is larger than one, then it's an indication that the diffusive wave will be the appropriate choice here. And as we can see from the diagram, uh, both FC and FI were much larger than one, and D was larger than one, which those flags will tell us that the diffusive wave is appropriate. So we wanted to see if that is actually reflected in the results. So we looked at the discharge hydrograph, one of the locations where we actually have measurements, and we applied all three methods in here. And you can see they are actually quite comparable. So in terms of the discharge, discharge hydrograph, all three methods give us very similar results uh, for, the, for the entire 11 year period. Then we took that and applied it to uh, 18 other locations and was the same conclusion that all the three methods were comparable in giving us the discharge hydrograph. Uh, when we looked at the water level, however, uh, the diffusive and the dynamic wave were comparable, while the Muskingum Kunj was unable to give us good representation of the, of the water level hydrograph. That is because the river was too flat. It does have a pretty strong backwater influences, and the, the Muskingum Kunj was unable to capture that. Um, if we actually look at the water level hydrograph everywhere else, um, the diffusive and the dynamic was quite comparable. So that's an indication here in this particular example that the diffusive wave is a fast and robust scheme and it is sufficient for an example like this. We do not need a, a, a dynamic wave here. However, we cannot fall back into the kinematic wave because it will give us uh, uh, an inaccurate discharge uh, water level hydrograph. Here is another example where we went to a much smaller river. It has complex hydraulics. Uh, it has a storage uh, area in the middle of it that actually induces reverse flow. And then again, we applied all three methods using the internal flags. It looks like we need dynamic wave for part of the hydrograph or part of the simulation time. And then we need to fall back into a diffusive wave. When we looked at the results, um, here is a discharge hydrograph where we you can see that we actually, for part of the time, we go negative, which means that the discharge actually is flowing north toward the storage area. Both the diffusive and the dynamic wave were able to capture that dynamic. The Muskingum Kunj actually stops at zero, so it's unable to actually capture a reverse flow. Um, in addition to that, it also is unable to capture a, a good water level hydrograph. So these are kind of examples that shows where we actually need to uh, upgrade Muskingum Kush to something else, either diffusive or dynamic. Uh, third, the, the, the last point that I wanted to make here is that 
poor hydraulics if they are dominated in a river, if the hydraulics is dominated by the runoff and the hydrology, the diffusive wave actually does a good job. Um, if we get into areas where the tidal signal and the hydraulics start to become dominated by the water level instead of the discharge, the diffusive wave itself breaks down also. If you look at this diagram here, uh, the dynamic wave captures the hydraulics uh, induced by tide signal in addition to the runoff hydrograph, but the diffusive is unable to. So um, the last thing that I want to show is a quick animation to show uh, the flow in a steep channel. And then we induced backwater effects until it overwhelms the whole channel. And we will show uh, in real time here how we switch between methods based on the flags. So here it started at a uh, completely supercritical flow. And as the water level here, as you can see, is going up, we actually started to induce, uh, there is a hydraulic jump in here in the diffusive wave is actually doing a good job of capturing that. But ultimately we have to switch to dynamic wave when the, uh, the flooding from the downstream became excessive for a little while, and then it will actually switch us back. Um, so that's a, it's, a, it's an illustration of how we intend to switch between different methods based on the need of um, the accuracy uh, induced by the hydraulics. So in summary, the dynamic wave, obviously it is applicable to all hydraulic conditions, but it is unnecessary to use it everywhere. So we should limit it and we plan to limit it to perhaps areas that are dominated by tidal or transition zone uh, signals. Uh, because this is where the flow acceleration uh, and the inertia terms are pretty significant. Uh, and actually, the speed that we reported today can actually be improved. The diffusive wave um, is actually applicable to a broad set of condition. It does not have limitations on bit slope. We can apply it to flat uh, slopes and even adverse slopes if we want to. Uh, it does capture backwater effects quite well. It does break down when we have a strong tidal uh, complications. So that's when it becomes limiting. Um, it does. It is very stable, um, and it's actually comparable in the sp in terms of speed to the Muskingum Kunj, which is uh, the current method in the National Water Model. Muskingum Kunj, obviously, it is stable. It is computationally efficient. It does have slope limitations. We cannot apply it in adverse or flat slopes. We have to induce, even artificially, if we have to, uh, a positive downward slope. Uh, and it does not capture downstream effects. If, if we have downstream effects, it's, it's, um, then it's off. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge that, that this research is done in collaboration with the National Water Center colleagues. Um, and uh, this project is funded by the JTTI uh, initiative. And uh, I hope that I left enough time for some questions. Yeah, any question for Iha? Uh, there's no question coming up from Slack. But I do see some people is trying to type. OK. Or maybe we can move on. Uh, I can, right. on and I, we can communicate offline through Slack. Yeah. Yeah, I can ask one question. So you mentioned that, like in the water model, it's wolf best. Now your scheme is implemented to the UFS? S say it again, please, the question. The, so the scheme is implemented in UFS now? No, no, it's, uh, the, we are working toward um, maybe in the new version of the National Water Model will capture this scheme, uh, but it has not been implemented as of yet. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, so we'll move on to the next speaker, Hanming Henry Zhuang. The title is Development of NCEP FV3 Deep Atmosphere Dynamics for UFS Space Weather Applications. Henry, go ahead. Okay, I try to share screen first. Can you see my screen? Yes. Good, thank you. Okay, uh, got the full screen now, I think. Okay, I changed the uh, title a little bit uh, because uh, I think the deep atomic dynamic, uh, we don't have a lot of uh, results yet, we're still doing, but the, the when the whole atomic model is pretty new to our society, our uh, community, so I think it's maybe a good idea to take this opportunity to to talk, talk, talk about the more clear to everybody. 
Uh, this is basically a, a dynamic developing. So the Satya and uh, Adam is actually, yeah, it's the one actually help me, but I communicate with the team uh, uh, periodically uh, sometimes. And so the team, like uh, this, this project is very much part of the uh, the space weather application that the team actually talking about it and uh, and uh, we needed to uh, consult some of the manager that's like publicity and then came here. Next one, so a little bit background that uh, we know that the uh, NC operational automotive model uh, such as GFS use, use for the weather and the climate, they are vertical domain uh, covering actually of course, from the low atmosphere, stratosphere, uh, the troposphere, stratosphere, and probably a little bit uh, lower mesosphere. It's only around uh, 60 and 80 kilometer in height. But the space waves are actually very really high. They cover uh, thermosphere, ionosphere, plasma sphere, as the uh, team talked about today in the morning. And all that, uh, uh, Plasma and the electric dynamic are actually active there. So that domain usually range from maybe around 100 kilometers to 10,000 kilometers in height. So in order to couple your uh, couple the space with a model with uh, the automotive model, then we have a tool uh, extend our automotive model up to the height possibly to cover space with a model as uh, Tim say that there is a, we are not just a interface coupling, uh, coupling. We are actually three dimensional regreeting require. Uh, so it's very much like a three time, three dimensional grid coupling. So the, if we look at, uh, if we extend, uh, extend our domain height vertically up to say 500 to 600 kilometer, then this, the pressure is very much like a 10 to uh, minus seven Pascal layer. And then we cover, say, you look at temp temperature profile for the standard atmosphere type, you can see that it's covered the thermosphere and the temperature up there, it's a bit much like a 12,000 degree K, K, K. And your, uh, your case, uh, could, your, uh, your case, uh, change, uh, like, uh, oxygen O2 will be, uh, decreased to the general and your O will be increasing. Okay. So, so when the, when the temperature is very high there, the dynamic is actually very strong, then the uh, wind also very strong. So, so when you take, when you take the uh, uh, weather and the climate model, the GFS up there very high, then you require some kind of uh, uh, changing in the dynamic. So actually, as we know that uh, in the morning, a team already introduced that uh, wind. So we developed in the EMC and actually it's based on an entropy version of uh, uh, NCEP GSM uh, in a generalized vertical coding that I published in a uh, uh, month's radio review. I call it the GSM win. The entropy as a thermodynamic variable actually played a major role to take care of the uh, variation of the automosphere con constantly covering the uh, entire automosphere, the whole automosphere from top uh, troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, up, mesosphere, and up to the thermosphere. And also, as I say, that up there the wind is very strong, so we require some kind of molecular diffusion to embrace another law to stabilize the upper atmosphere disturbance to have a longer time integration. And also, we need some kind of physics because the GFS physics is up to only mesos mesosphere, a little bit mesosphere, but going up there, we require maybe a uh, gravity wave track, whatever uh, radiation should be included. So in, so if we look at the, uh, uh, this just, just show you, quickly show you that the, your 64 day of the operational GFS, GFS before is very much like uh, about 10 times more uh, shallow than the uh, wind model of 150 layer. And if we look at the, uh, uh, the gas tracer, 
Uh, operational, we have O2, uh, O3 for the ozone, because ozone is very important, cover, covering in our uh, lower part of the atmosphere here, and uh, uh, I mean in the GS, GFS run. But in a way, we also need the O2, O3 variation for the thermosphere. So after we put that in, physics in, and actually we learned it very well with coupling with IPE, uh, that's a space with a model. And this is the courtesy from the WEM, uh, the, from the, the uh, team, uh, team's uh, team, that uh, actually it's a, it's a particular, sorry, a, a, it's a case of uh, a particular day that uh, the, the uh, the uh, solar stone, uh, solar wind there. And uh, we show that uh, a, a natural atmosphere and the, and the density also show the vertical multi motion uh, is that high. Uh, okay, uh, next one. So in order to, to uh, go into the UFS application. Now we know that FV3 is the UFS model right now, and also the M MC operational automation model, and it's also had the same coverage as the GSM. It's the same thing as a, 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 a automotive condition that uh, they don't consider the uh, variation of the, uh, as I show in the thermosphere. That's the same work we have, we have to treat uh, the GS, uh, the FV3 uh, by whatever we have done for the GS, GSM when Okay, so I just try to share with you what we have done step by step in, the, in, in our dynamic part is uh, purely dynamic developing. So first we actually uh, consider extension the FV3 model top to the height uh, to up to uh, 500 and 600 kilometer and we need it because there's no physics there so we need to make sure it can be run with a diabetical first without the physics then we then we stand that up to layer and we turn turn on uh, um, when we turn on the physics we have to make sure the radiation from layer 90 to layer 150 or 149 there should be a mean value of that radiation, and we find out that we require a very strong radon printing to uh, any anything two more two more okay uh, to to have instability and dramatical reduced wind. So okay, we, I have I better to speed up. So then the potential temperature also are different. Uh, we don't want to make a uh, entropy change to the FV three. So we. We put a some kind of like a, a, a concept of the multi gases and put in the virtual temperature, and also we put a, um, a molecular diffusion in and because the uh, the uh, GFS is a spectral model, so increase the molecular diffusion is very easy and it's uh, for the stability, it's, it's no problem. But if we three is people model, we cannot do increase the uh, diffusion. So I apply an explicit way. And this is show you the coefficient for all the risk of the molecular diffusion, uh, for the viscosity, conductivity, and uh, this uh, divisibility that's very large. And okay, and this is just show you what we put into the FB3. Right now, we run in the C96 FB3, and this is show you the vertical profile of uh, the wind. Wind is very strong right now, it's uh, moving, and temperature is uh, gradually changing and become a little bit stable but we still uh, try to see more and, and tune it. So, so the next step is put the uh, uh, model physics in and uh, uh, that require to put uh, under uh, the, uh, we, we put the same package as in the GSM when uh, it's called ideal physics uh, into the, the uh, FB3. We can, we are based on we are using the framework of the CCPP. And I will talk about a little bit of a deep atmosphere that we originally want to say, but uh, this is a theory, the concept of the most of the uh, models running right now is a shallow atmosphere. So it's a shallow atmosphere assumption that all the vertical is uh, like a parallel. But if you consider your vertical is very high, then you should consider the curvature of the Earth. So that is, you relax your 
uh, some of uh, the, the pseudo atmosphere you become deep atmosphere dynamic. You think the atomic dynamic, you will find out that your career is false and everything required to be full career is false in order to have a uh, uh, fully uh, uh, dynamic. And that actually actually not good only for the uh, space weather and also other uh, models as well. So that's make the uh, let's come to the assumption that we finish the fourth version of the FV3 when dynamic and uh, we are actually uh, uh, processing to implement our method field and some sphere physics into uh, right now using IPD then later on we use CCPP and we hope we can get the support. Right now we're doing in time, we hope we can support to doing the deep atmosphere later on, not only of every three way, but also for other UAVs applications. Okay, thank you. Thank you, yeah. Uh, maybe one quick question? There is no coming up from Slack. Okay, then we will move on to next speaker, uh, James Purcell. Eliminating grid imprinting with a conformal cubic overset grid. Jim, James, go ahead. I should turn off. Hey, Jim, are you, are you trying to speak? I think you're on, you're muted. Yeah, you need to unmute yourself. Can yeah. you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. I, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Can okay. you uh, click on present? Sorry. I, what do I have to click on? Yeah, you are. Pre you, he's presenting. Am I presenting? So you don't have to see this screen. You just have to look right. at this. Screen. So if you can see my my slides, uh, it's eliminating grid and printing with conformal cubic overset overset grid. My co-author is Mjodrik Rancic. And I'll. Uh, so you have to go to presenting. Present. Yeah. And okay. I'll go to the next slide. So the, the problem that we're faced with, it's a subtle problem, is that when we run cubic grids based on separate mnemonic projections for each face of the cube, we get a sharp angular discontinuity across each edge of the corner, especially when we've run the forecast for a few days. And you can see the effect here along the edges of the, the cube. This is thanks to Fang Lin, Yang, and Yali Ma for providing these figures. And the imprinting does not entirely go away, even if we choose a, a different cubic grid geometry that remains smooth and continuous across each edge. For example, a few years ago, we were in the sort of competition for the next operational global model. We had the UJ cube sphere, and that was the um, grid that has perfectly smooth and continuous grid lines across the edges. So we don't get any grid imprinting along edges, but we still get a very sharp localized imprinting at the corners because of the curvature singularity in the coordinate system, which is shown in these uh, two panels to the left here, showing the, um, the divergence, two different ways of handling the divergence. And the, the topological reality is that no single valued mapping to a gridable plane or region can avoid the necessary presence of singularities. But if we remove the stipulation that the mapping be single valued, we can look for a partially self overlapping grid that is not only smooth, but also conformal. So 
here's an example of a very simple conformal mapping with the Riemann, what is known as Riemann surfaces. Um, sorry, the writing's a bit fuzzy. To the left is a simple analytic formula for a, a mapping in the complex plane to the, to the complex plane involving a square root of, of the, um, the variable z. And you get a fairly strong branch point singularity. You have to go around this picture twice before you get back to the beginning. That's what we mean by a Riemann surface. And uh, if you change the function so that you have a, the square root of z to the fifth, a much higher odd power of, of z, then you get a much smoother mapping. The singularity is still there, but it's a very weak singularity. So singularities that are weak are not really visible by the numerics directly in a numerical model if you apply it to this domain. And um, so that's the idea that we want to use in order to get uh, a systematic way of overlapping a grid near the corners of the cubic geometry so that we don't have any strong singularities. So let's go to the next picture. So for more exo exotic Riemann services, under the right conditions, it's possible to combine power expansions about several distinct expansion centers into a single coherent analytic function. And this is an example. Again, it's a planar mapping with a Riemann surface, a two-valued Riemann surface. Now, if you look at the blue region, it, it's uh, free of any mapping singularities and consists of altogether three quadrants, which is what we want when we join the three panels of a cube at a corner. The branch point singularities are shown in small circles along two of the edges of the what would be the cube. The red domain is the unphysical part, and there are additional mapping singularities. In order to get a relatively high order of smoothness at the branch point singularities, there's a sort of conservation of singularities. You have to put singularities elsewhere. Well, you can put them on the at uh, infinity uh, on the red sheet of the Riemann of the two sheeted Riemann surface. So you can sort of hide them away. That's not the part of the domain that you need very much of when you do the numerics. So let me go on. So the method by which the power series are brought into mutual agreement is a variant of something in mathematics called the, the Schwarz iteration you effectively solve something like an elliptic equation, or in this case, a sort of Riemann, Cauchy Riemann type equation within a domain bounded by a smooth curve where you have the values along the curve. And simultaneously, you have another solution which uh, with another smooth curve surrounding a singularity or a, an expansion point. And the uh, boundary values are given by the other solutions or th that are available. And so it's a kind of bootstrapping process by which you can pull up a complete coherent analytic function uh, through um, the expansions about different points. You can put the expansion points at singularities, which is helpful in the case of the branch points, because you know exactly how to do that. You just use odd odd powers and the expansion. Two more minutes. OK. I'm nearly done, I think. Uh, you have the conformal cubic overset grid that we have generated by this process has a, a geometry completely specified by the branch point order of smoothness and the position of the branch point pairs along the uh, respective edges of the, of the cube. The planar conformal image which is by a stereographic projection of the bicorn overset, this uh, shape that I show on the right here. This itself can be uh, subjected to the solution of a, a conformal mapping, to, in this case, to um, an infinite parallel strip, which allows you to get contours, the red contours in this mapping can provide the contours of a smoothing function for progressively blending and smoothing the solutions that come from both sides of the grid. So if, uh, the numerics of the FV3 model will not feel the singularities at the branch points. As I said before, the mapping is sufficiently smooth there. And the solution reconciliation, interpolation, and blending performed at each time step need be done only inside the tiny oversets 
so the additional numerical burden is negligible. So the grid resolution, although not uniform, does not vary greatly, unlike the pure conformal cubic grid. And the conformal grid itself provides a potential saving in the model because the covariant and contravariant vector and tensor representations essentially coincide, which means that a lot of the cross terms and the dynamics will become redundant. Um, conservation and monotonicity, the small size of the overlapping zones will allow for an efficient preservation of the mass conservation and monotonicity of the solution. The mass conservation can be achieved by monitoring the budget incoming and outcoming fluxes. So you have a kind of a posteriori method of constraint restoration, which you can apply consistent with the monotonicity constraints. So we are in the process of formulating a conformal cubic overset version of this FV3 model using the methods that are described here. And we, we uh, should soon be in the position to decide, to decide whether these methods eliminate grid imprinting, as we hope. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Nope. Okay, we'll move on, move forward. So the next speaker is Jeffrey McQueen. The title is Progress and Plans for Advance in Air Quality and Aerosol Modeling in UFS. Jeffrey, go ahead. Okay, hi, thank you very much, Lily. Um, this is kind of a mistake, but <laughs> anyway, it'll give us an opportunity to talk. This is uh, Ivanka Stajna presented this morning a little bit about our plans for air quality, regional prediction, regional and global. And I'll just kind of state this, the, the, short, the status really of what's going on. So the first thing we heard about this morning was the GEFS V12 aerosol member. There's one member of the GEFS V12 going into September. There's 30 members total. One, mem uh, well, 32 with this one. The one member will have uh, aerosol from go kart from a go kart model, which has smoke and dust and um, um, sulfates and uh, some big improvements that you'll hear about from other people later today within those uh, within those systems. Um, this is the first time this replaces the old NGAC system, which was using the GSM. Of course, this system is using the FE three core dynamic core in the GFS version fifteen physics and and uh, one thing unique that the folks at, at GSL did was to inline the uh, tracer transport directly within the physics, the SAS scheme, and the uh, and, 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 and the uh, PBL scheme, the EDMF scheme. Hi, Jeff. Are you trying to share your screen now? Yes, I was sharing my screen now. I guess not, huh? Yeah, some people cannot see it. Perhaps refresh the browser for those of you who cannot see the screen. Okay, uh, let's see. Refresh the browser is a good idea. Can, can anybody see it? I guess some people, but not everyone. Okay, let's uh, get rid of everything I can. I cannot. You cannot. Oh, you're kind no, of important. See you. you only can see my face. Okay, uh, let's go back to that. Mm, who is presenting? I Oh, you know, you're right. I was not. Okay, let's try it again. Sorry about that. No worries. Let's see if it makes it. Okay, uh, you should see it now. Yeah, we can see now. Thank you. Yeah, so basically, this is the guest version 12 aerosol model. It has aerosols in it. One member in September 15th, it'll go operational at 25 kilometers, and there'll be 31 other members without. So that's that was a big collaborative effort with GSL and Ezra and a no, ARL. And here's just some predictions from Partha showing the evaluation compared to different parts of the uh, domain. You can see, for example, over South Africa, the operational system, which is in green, experimental, which is in blue, which was a better agreement, although an over prediction in August. And we'll talk about that in the section in the section in the second. Um, and uh, so, but overall, like here in South America, we're seeing an improvement that the upper, the old NGAC was just not capturing many large events. Um, here's over the Atlantic, dust storms especially. However, what's motivating some of the plans that Ivanka had 
this morning are things like this. Uh, so over South Africa, we see a strong overprediction of aerosols. So before we do uh, aerosol cloud interactions, uh, we've got to kind of be careful that we don't hurt meteorological forecast. And this, an average, this is an average over a month, showing a very strong bias over the month of um, biomass burning predictions of smoke. And this is using NESDIS Global Biomass Burning Emission System. So we need to do some. Uh, so they are funded through the R to O program to to improve do something about these improvements and also could partly be due to, to plume rise as yeah. well. Could you use presenter mode so everyone can see more bigger figure? Okay. That's five. Okay. Let's see. If you... Uh, you can click on slideshow then click on play okay thank you wait for clear slide right okay so do you see over south africa you probably see it this strong over prediction this is comparing to aerosol optical depth uh, over prediction compared to an analysis for the month of august of 2019 and obviously this kind of over prediction would strongly influence if we start to do cloud radiative interactions that we, you know, we could have some big problems there. So we need to correct these kind of biases that is, is a month average bias. Um, here's the dust storm. Overall, we did great for dust. You can see here on the left, this is our model, and you can see how it is capturing the dust plume that is moving east. So the magnet, so the storm is indeed captured. This was a historic dust plume with values greater than one, two, I mean, values that we have never seen really from Saharan dust. Now, the, uh, the analysis from the International Center for for Aerosol Prediction shows a much stronger plume than we did, and um, showing this large, uh, strong plume. You can think of it as not moisture, but let's call it aerosol uh, hitting the U.S., the, the the Gulf of Mexico, and we use these these um, values of aerosols from the global model for boundary conditions for the regional model that covers the U.S. That's called the CMAC model. And you can see, I've never seen 24-hour particulate matter values this high. These are code oranges, very, very high over the, over the south, southern U.S., but we didn't really capture it because our, our system, while it did predict the transport excellently, and it just didn't predict the magnitude of the system perfectly. And that's something that you'll hear Barry Bigger talk a little bit about later on how we need to, to improve on that. So going into the national air quality forecast, uh, you know, you heard a little bit about this this morning. It's currently nationwide, Alaska and Hawaii, and it has 48-hour uh, predictions now going to 72 hours. Um, and we're going to be moving to the, the global biomass burning emissions product smoke uh, coming years. So here's just an average and overall prediction of the operational system in red, unbiased corrected, and the squares are the bias correction. So you can see from, and this is the experimental system in blue for the Western US and then for the Eastern US. And you can see the importance of bias correction overall for the month of July, going as far as we could through this month, uh, a nice improvement in bias correction correlation. You know, the further you go down this line, oops, in correlation, the better it gets. So further to the right, it gets better, but the, high, the higher you go, it, <clears throat> the RMSC is better. So uh, that's basically what, a, uh, what, this, what this slide is sort of telling us. In the Eastern, and so we see a nice improvement in, in root mean square error. We see a nice improvement. Okay, see a nice improvement from the experimental, and the experimental model is using the GFS to be fit the GFS uh, to drive it. So it's just using the GFS alone has, you know, the FV3 GFS has shown a nice improvement. So here is the recent ozone episode. Now this is the experimental model on top going to three days on, and, and showing the, the so, so showing that actually the, the th day three forecast is very similar to the day one forecast for these kind of events. They're very stagnant, they're very consistent. And so it can show skill 
you know, out to three days. So I know the forecasters are really excited to have that and extending it beyond day two. This is the operational system beyond day two. Both system overpredicted the ozone to this event compared to the orange circles compared to the compared to the color fill. And uh, partially that's probably due to COVID-19, partially due to the resolution at 12 kilometers, not capturing the, the marine boundary layer very well. Um, this is something I have to skip this one. This is basically the uh, FE3 CMAC run showing um, predictions of wildfire smoke this past June and how it agreed sometimes with the fire radiative power and sometimes it did not. Um, so basically, this is what Ivanka talked about it this morning. And we're going to improve globally and regionally. And you're going to hear about this in less than 20 minutes if I stop talking on the Nexus Hemco system. Um, you'll hear about the that's the new emission system. From Patrick Campbell, you'll hear about the biomass burning emission systems from Shoba's group and then what, what she plans to do. Data simulation, there is one talk on that later. Uh, George Grell talking about the uh, the go kart coupling next. Um, and uh, physical processes uh, are basically we have to get, we want to get to a place where the aerosols impact weather. Like, uh, and that's really the goal, but we have to improve. And by using data simulation, we probably will. Without data simulation, we may not be able to do the aerosol radiation interactions, but with we with it, we can. So that's what I have. Uh, it's an exciting time to be an air quality scientist because I've never seen this kind of progress or this kind of support in, in, in these past two years. So it's an exciting time to be involved. And you'll hear some great talks later about convective interactions too from George Burrell's uh, group and uh, Sarah Lou's group. So thanks for listening. Uh, now the real good stuff will be coming up next. Okay, thank you. Maybe one quick question? No, for now. Okay, no we'll move forward. Yeah. Uh, next speaker is uh, Judge Graham from NOAA PSL Building Atmospheric Composition Modules for UFS, different strategies for development and company with global and regional models. Good. Go All right, I'm trying to uh, share my screen. Yeah, I can see your screen. Do you see it, Claire? Yeah. All right, yeah. then we'll start. So I will try to advertise a little bit of what we have done over the years and what we think would be the best way forward for coupling atmospheric composition suites with UFS. To do that, I will provide a little bit of background and history before going to what we think the future should look like. Most folks will know the difference between offline and online because of computational expense. Offline used to be used as a primary approach in the past, uh, where you have a chemical transport model, a CTM, uh, run independent of an NWP model, only using hourly or three hourly output times. Quite often, even only snapshot values, which is, of course, introducing many additional errors. Online and or inline approaches run CTMs coupled with NWP models with various degrees of consistency. Online and or inline can mean the same thing. Over inline is usually only used if no coupling infrastructure is applied. Do we really need online approaches? The simple answer is that atmospheric composition impacts weather, so we want to account for that. Additionally, for air quality forecasting, Offline introduces significant errors, increasingly worse for higher resolution. Because of time limits in this talk, we will focus on NWP models. Uh, naturally, similar approaches also have been introduced in the climate community, which of course realized this, uh, the importance of atmospheric composition, uh, maybe even earlier than the weather forecast community. Examples there would be CM3 from Leo Donna et al, as well as AM4.1, uh, Zhao et al. and Larry Horowitz. An early online approach was MM5 Chem, which coupled the well-known Radom2 chemical transport model. Since there was not much effort on mass consistency in MM5 for short-range forecasting, the coupled CDM, CTM had its own advection. 
This model was used here at GSL and CSL about 20 years ago, also for a field experiment. There are still many inconsistencies with, with this approach, which would weigh in heavily, especially for cloud resolving aqueous phase applications, where you really want the same invection algorithms for all variables. Similar approach is WARF CMAC, but this was done intentionally from EPA uh, to be able to use CMAC offline for regulatory work the same way they had done before. Uh, and WARF CMAC, I have to also say, has included uh, atmospheric composition impacts on weather. The next step up, and this still plays a role in the current UFS approaches, is WARF CAM. Initially, the same suite from MM5 CAM was moved to WARF CAM, but without the advection, since WARF numerics was much more improved. So this was a step up in consistency too. Physics was somewhat more consistent also, still done mostly in atmospheric composition suite though. Next, much needed complexity was added to make this a truly interesting modeling system for scientists to use all over the world. KPP was added to make it easy to add different chemical mechanisms, radiation, and microphysics impact was added by PNNL. NCA also became involved early into the further development and improvements. Now, these additional complexities were of great importance to make WARFCAM a very successful community model because it opens up possibility to study cloud aerosol interaction processes in great detail and it made it much more interesting to use for many scientists leading to improvements also in a simple scheme. And I added Mozart mechanisms, uh, the simple aerosol go-kart aerosol modules were improved further. Air Force uh, uh, played a role in there with the dust parameterization. And all were still using the same chem driver from WAFCAM and WAFCAM was maintained at GSL with almost no funding. Before implementing this into our current operational systems, WAFCAM was advanced further. It now has 63 chemistry aerosol options with different complexity. Some aspects of the atmospheric composition suite were merged with physics. RAPCAM was run in real time for air quality prediction till May of 2019, and it is now also used for RAP and her smoke, uh, which uh, was mentioned before already. Original publication is more than 1,400 citations and also received the Harding Schmidt Prize in 2016. A mention at least should also be MPAS coupled with CMAC, and this is a completely inline version, so no coupling used there. So and now we created a new OPS component out of the suite. And this is being tested in FE3, but only with a simple go-kart aerosol routines, biomass burning and wildfire plume rise, as well as the complex me calculations for aerosol interactions. We also created a CCPP component out of the same thing, which is a more direct inline approach. Uh, and you've heard already about the uh, new uh, aerosol model, GEFS aerosol. Uh, the pictures here show the comparison between the new model and the current operational model in biasness, this is a five month average. Finally, the chem driver still used inline in wrap smoke and her smoke. And this possibly makes National Weather Service the first major operational center that actually includes impact of wildfires and weather prediction and actually improves an already world class storm scale prediction system. On the left, lower left, the red line is the temperature bias when the aerosol feedback is included. So there's three options for coupling. Inline, new ops, which is an ESMF approach and CCPP. Inline, the old fashioned way might be the easiest to start with for us older science guys like me, um, who like to mess with their own code a lot. But it is more difficult to move to different modeling systems. New ops, is much tougher to work with for the older science guys, uh, probably the easiest to work with the computer scientists. Once it's created, it's much easier to move to a different modeling system. New ops provides interoperability for model components among different coupled systems. 
is maybe the only way to use it for alien models, such as different grids or resolutions. And then there's CCPP, the Common Community Physics Package. Most of the older scientists will still find it a little harder to work with, but less so than new ops. CCPP appears to be the only way for us to make it easy to use any or all the chemistry routines inside the physics, since we're using CCPP already for the physics. Any routine in the CCPP framework can be mixed and matched with any other routine in the CCPP framework. One more minute. No effort in moving to a different model. No matter which option to take from these three, though, the lower level routines should and can be written independent of either approach and or model. And that's the idea also behind the uh, future of the combined uh, NOAA NASA repository. So the optimal future, we're using CCP for physics, let's use CCP for at least some of the chemical modules. Lower level routines should be independent no matter what. And uh, the third bullet here, example of an advantage, the plume rise, for example, in CCPP will work for GEFs aerosols, for her smoke, and CMAC if it is used in physics without any modification. No need to re-implement into a complex chemical component. But I would advertise also that hold on to new ops. And the biggest advantage, possible advantage I can see there is that you can split off the chemical mechanism at some point and run that massively parallel, truly massively parallel, because it is even parallel in a vertical direction. Another aspect may be anthropogenic emissions programs. I can't tell much about that. We're currently discussing this issue, and then maybe you may hear some more afterwards. Uh, an example also biogenic emissions, sea salt dust emissions, uh, maybe different again, might fit best in the land surface model. Mix and match, possibly having the option of a new ops cap on top of a CCPP may be the best approach. How about use of CPUs, GPUs? Could the chemical mechanism be split off with new ops, recoded, and effectively use GPUs? What would a machine learning module look like that replaces the chemical mechanism? And finally, uh, after a, a very fairly dry talk, I have one fun slide that I really want to show too. On the right side is the air quality forecast for today uh, using the rapid refresh chemistry, which we run this summer to test the impacts of COVID-19 emissions. And you can see it's not looking very pleasant there on the East Coast in the New York area. Uh, fairly high surface ozone concentrations predicted. And on the left side, I'd like to do this one <clears throat> because it is a very uh, unique I mean, the upper one is GEFs aerosols, new ops, and the lower one is the CCPP version. The upper one is a one-day forecast. The lower one is an S2S one. It's a two-month free-running forecast. And it's kind of really interesting to see how similar the collium organic carbon is in both of these runs. Even though the lower run is completely free-running, meteorology and chemistry for two months. Uh, which, uh, again, points out, especially for S2S, it's really important to get the emissions right, in particular for, uh, for the fires. Uh, so, and that's uh, the end of my talk. Thank you, Judge. Uh, one quick question. Yes, uh, there's a question from Fang Lin Yang. Is the uh, MIE calculation in line? Is it expensive? Can pre-computed tables be used? Um, can you... Rep uh, can you repeat that question or can I? Um, yeah, you can check on slide. So basically, is the MIE calculation in line? Is it expensive? Can pre-computed tables be used? Yes, uh, now I get the question. Yeah, the MIE calculation is expensive. It can be done, on, it is done online. It's not extremely expensive because it's not done at every time step. It's like radiation. Uh, I think ideally we probably want to use the uh, online tables uh, that NASA has, for example, uh, because that's that is more efficient and there's really um, it's nice to have the meat calculations just for uh, for testing for for making sure that whatever we get from the NASA tables also is is reasonable in comparison, but operationally. 
we would you want to use the the tables, the lookup tables? Okay, thanks, George. Okay, thank you, Judge. We'll move forward. The next speaker, the last speaker, Patrick Campbell. Development of lower emission and exchange unified system Nexus for UFS atmospheric chemistry and the composition models. Go ahead, Patrick. Sorry, this is uh, Barry Baker. I'm actually going to present instead of Patrick. Okay. So uh, please bear with me just one second. Um, can everyone see my screen? Yes. So, um, one thing that you've noticed is that there's going to be a lot of different air composition models going. So, what I'm going to talk about is how um, we're going to create a unified emission and exchange system so that both so that we essentially we don't need multiple code bases or multiple programs to be able to create emissions for all these different applications. Um, and so, you know, as George was mentioning, um, you know, we have GEX aerosols, which includes essentially the chemical driver from WorfChem, and that can have multiple different types of chemistry and aerosol um, descriptions. But then we also have things like CMAC, which you know use, uses also different um, chemical mechanisms and aerosol descriptions. So we need we need to be able to um, create these systems so that they can be used for all applications. And so that's so to kind of like just just to go over the motivation for this again. So you know. Within UFS, we're going to have different aerosol and atmospheric composition models. And a major component of this is the emissions of both gas phase, gas phase and aerosol. Um, so we need a flexible system to be able to do this. And we need consistency between emissions and other um, physics processes within these systems. So th that's where the idea for the NOAA Emission Exchange Unified System came up. With. And the idea is that we can use essentially existing models as a base. So in this case, we're going to use the Harvard emission component originally developed by Christoph Keller to be able to create a community emission processing system for a UFS. And of course, we're collaborating with both Harvard, NASA, NCAR, um, and other NOAA offices such as CSD and GSL. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we need to be able to do is to rapidly include new emission data sets. So in this case, um, what I'm showing is the emissions from the SEDS 2014 emission database, which is being used in GEFS aerosols. And then um, recently we just, we went and grabbed the new emission data set that released multiple years later, and we're able to dra include this really rapidly. And you can see, you know, some pretty drastic changes. So for example, over Saudi Arabia and Northern Africa, you can see um, large decreases in emissions over these, especially over Saudi Arabia. Um, you can see there's shipping emissions are changing along the coast of um, the US and Canada and also along Hawaii. And then you can see um, large decreases in emissions over um, Eastern China, which if you remember in both George and Jeff's talks, we saw an actual um, a high bias in these areas. So that's just to show you that, you know, the emissions are a, a critical component of these 
atmospheric composition models, and it, can, it shouldn't be neglected. So the other thing that we want to be able to do is to blend emission data sets. So in this case, what we're doing is we're blending the EDS 2017 um, emissions from shipping with the OMI HTAP 2019 emissions over land. And what, what you can see is some dr pretty drastic changes. So for, for example, in Western China, we can see that um, in comparison, the OMI HTAP saw lower emissions over that area. Um, now, it's, it was already fairly low in that area, so it might not have much impact on the model, but we can see that um, there, there's a, lo a lot of differences specifically over like Saudi Arabia, um, the emissions over the Western United States, and also um, changes over multiple continents such as Australia, South America, and Northern Africa. So just as an example, um, what we did is we did multiple tests with a, a few of these data sets. So in what we're showing is um, the HEMCO and HEMCO plus simulation. So what we found was what we were trying to do was show that we could get the exact same emissions or exact same model results with the prep chem sources versus HEMCO um, emission models. And we they, they basically are the same they're you know the air, the differences are less than one percent um and so what i'm going to be showing is the differences between the hemco plus and the hemco simulations and the hemco plus essentially uses the omi htap 2017 so2 data where everything else is the same as the original base simulations um, and then we're also using the um regional emissions from the 2016 uh, modeling platform just over the United States. So what we can see here is that um, in the top left plot, I'm showing the aerosol optical thickness from total from the HEMCO simulation. And in the bottom left, you can see the differences between the um, HEMCO plus and HEMCO simulations. And what we're seeing is we're seeing drastic decreases over um, Eastern China and using these simulations. And this is almost, on the right-hand side, you can see that this is almost entirely because of the sulfate aerosol emissions. And so just changing these emissions, we can see drastic changes. And in this case, we're seeing changes up to um, 0 0.3 AOD, which is actually fairly large. And so let's look at this a little bit closer. So um, what, what we're doing now is we're looking at surface PM 2.5 bias using the OpenAQ data set and being able to see the differences. And so in the left plot is the HEMCO simulations and on the right side is the HEMCO plus simulations. And what we're able to do is decrease the, the normalized mean bias by about 12, um, percentage points and also the normalized mean bias and index agreement all decreased over um, China. But whenever we go to um, the United States, with including the systems, and um, what we saw is actually an increase in the bias, although it was actually fairly similar. So, for, ex for example, in the Western United, United States, we saw a increase increase in bias from 22% to 26%. Now, on. This might be because we um, did not include a source or two and, you know, more investigation needs to be, needs to occur there. But it, it is actually really encouraging that we can see this drastic effect just by changing the emissions. And so that's why we're advocating for a more unified emission system so that these types of studies can happen across different applications and different complexities. So just a quick roadmap, we, you know, we want, we want to use HEMCO as the base emission model for anthropogenic, but we need a system that can run both online and offline so that we can do more rapid testing and HEMCO al allows for this. Um, what we, we need to do is create emissions for the FE3 SARS, so this is the standalone regional CMAC. Um, at high resolution, and we need to also 
be able to implement the um, fire emissions into this. So as part of that, it, it is the speciation between um, chemical mechanisms and things that will be implemented into the um, emission processor while the plume res will be done in the physics. And then, you know, what we also want to be able to do in the future is to basically implement ensemble gas and aerosol dry, depos dry, dry deposition extensions. And this allows to do more of a probab probabilistic approach. And because there's actually a lot of disagreement between deposition models and also disagreement between deposition models and what is measured in, um, in the field. We would also like to include biogeochemical or agro ecosystem models, such as the um, EPIC model or the Descent model. And then, of course, you know, we want to do further um, development of Nexus and interface these with other ap atmospheric air composition models. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a quick question for Barry. No question. Okay, then no. we, I want to thank all the speakers again. So we are run short time. So we'll go to the next session. Thank you all. Thank you.